in. Four incredible panelists are going to be sharing their views with us over the next hour or so. Uh, feel free to reach out in the chat to talk with any of them. Chat is open and ready for you. Uh, feel free to reach out to them. Feel free to reach out to me or any of the other attendees. All we ask is that you please be respectful of everybody. Uh, number two, the number one thing you can do to help everyone in the session and also myself is to please mute yourself. So Zoom webinar is supposed to do that automatically if you're an, an attendee, but my experience of the past four months doing this has been that is not the case. So if you can please help us, it would really, really help me with the editing and also for your experience here with us. Finally, we are going to have uh, a few snap polls that are going to come up during uh, the course of our conversation. If you, uh, you know, everything's anonymous, all we want to do is to know what you're thinking uh, in regarding uh, different topics. Feel free to, you know, put down responses. We'll address them collectively. Uh, we're, this is not about data collection or anything. It's just a matter of us informing our conversation and getting you involved. Also, if you have a question, uh, we'll try to get to them towards the end of the session. Uh, the Q&A button is located at the bottom left center. So you're gonna put your questions and questions over there and we'll try to get to as many of them uh, towards the end of the program. So those of you just joining in, the future of Silicon Valley tech and startups, we'll be, get, we'll be getting going in about a minute. The chat is ready and open for you. Feel free to reach out to any of our panelists, uh, any, other, any of the other attendees or myself. We're all here for you. We just ask that you be respectful. Please remember to mute yourself and your mic. It will help us. Even though Zoom's supposed to do that automatically, it does not sometimes. And if you have a question that you wanna ask the panelists and you want us to address together, feel free to put it in the Q&A function. So looks like we have <coughs> a good crowd here. So we're gonna get going. There's no one has any questions. Doesn't look like we do. Okay. Without further ado. All right, so Lahari, yes, that is the way it's supposed to be, and that means you're good. So don't worry about it. There, are, it's just sometimes there's a glitch. So don't worry about it. You're good. Okay. If there's no other, looks like we're okay. Great. All right. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, no matter where it is you're tuning in from. Thank you so much. This is the future of Silicon Valley tech and startups. So this is our fifth Cities of Tech live podcast event. So happy to have all of you here. I am your host, Brian Antolin, the program manager at Line Run. And we are so, so, so very excited and fortunate to have four incredible community leaders from the Silicon Valley tech community uh, joining us for to share their insights and perspective on the future of Silicon Valley tech and startups. They include uh, Adeo Rossi, CEO and founder of the Founder Institute, David Cow, uh, managing partner F50 Ventures and founder of SVE, Stephanie Mars, managing director for entrepreneurship at the University of California, San Francisco, and Sydney Sykes, co-founder of Black VC and Angel Investor. So really wonderful to have all of you here. I can't thank all of you enough for, for doing this and for sharing some of your time and expertise with us. Before we jump into the conversation, something we're all looking forward to, just a little bit about who we are and what we do if you are new to any of our content or programming. Line Run is an experiential career and industry education platform for tomorrow's workforce. We empower our community of leaders to connect, innovate, and grow through media, events, and programs such as today's session. We invite you to check out our website, www.linerun.co, to learn more about our programs, our podcasts, classes, and career accelerator programs. So, Line Run. With that, we're going to start our one on one spotlights with Adeo. So, Adeo. Thank you again for being here. You have a, a massive amount of experience in all different parts and phases of, of Silicon Valley and, and tech in general. 
but from your perspective as a founder and community builder with roots in the Bay Area, what changes or shifts have you seen within Silicon Valley over the past few months as compared to the last year or two prior to COVID? Well, I mean, hi everyone. Uh, again, my name's Adeo. Yeah, uh, it's been dramatic, right? So if you live here versus, uh, you know, consider yourself a fan of what's happening in tech, it's, it's very different. So uh, you had the rise of very, very large companies such as Twitter, Facebook, Google, uh, that were all headquartered here. And then you had Netflix also here. And, and they started going through massive growth before uh, the pandemic hit. But when the pandemic hit, um, it just changed the entire uh, ethos of the whole region. So what was happening pre-pandemic is there were plane loads of people flying in every week, every month uh, to populate jobs at these fast growing tech companies who were building larger and larger campuses. And then when the pandemic started surfacing in, in January and then in February, you know, the Silicon Valley big tech companies were some of the first to respond by saying, hey, you know, work from home. You don't have to come into an office anymore. And that completely changed the character of this this area. And, and you don't really realize that from the outside. And, and we were also probably ahead of them. We, we stopped running physical programs in 200, over 200 cities around the world in, in uh, fe mid-February of 2020, before the tech companies actually sent their employees home. But when the tech companies sent their employees home, this weird shift in the Bay Area started to occur. And I'll, I'll give a quick quick thought on this. So first, um, most of the innovation that was happening in Cupertino and in Palo Alto and sort of southern parts of the Bay Area was already migrating to San Francisco before COVID hit. So San Francisco was the startup hotbed uh, of Silicon Valley before the pandemic hit. The pandemic hit, like San Francisco is, is scary. I, people, homeless people rolling around in the middle of the street where cars are, not the, the street where people walk, um, you know, muggings, uh, assaults, I just through the roof, half the city is left. And it once was this thriving hotbed, it's now been vacated. Conversely, you couldn't live in Palo Alto if you tried because Facebook, Google, all these people are trying to hire, 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 and people are populating the Southern Bay. Now the Southern, all, all the rich people left, all the rich execs left, and that's created opportunity. No Stanford students except grad students are coming in. And now there's like a beautiful resurgence of entrepreneurship here in the South Bay in Palo Alto. Palo Alto is like a lively, bustling place. Startups have returned. It's completely transformed the Bay Area back to an innovation hub versus a hub to fly in, you know, IIT grads to populate desk jobs at Google or Facebook. So it's been dramatic. Um, I don't know if other panelists agree, but I mean, it's been profound. Yeah, we'd love to have um, our other panelists chime in just on, on that one uh, initial assessment that the dynamics have changed. Um, Stephanie, from your perspective, UCSF, you, you're in San Francisco. Have you seen something very similar or has it been more of a- Have you been assaulted? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm home, so how would I know? <laughs> work, in fact, we've been told work from home until um, mid next year, mid, like I think it's June 2021. Um, unless, of course, we're scientists who need the lab or clinicians or in med school. So, so uh, I find it fascinating, Adio, what, how you've described the environment. It's not anything I'd heard about. What, I mean, it's such, you know, while I'm in, quote, Silicon Valley and the entrepreneurship world, I'm also in a different world, which is this whole life science healthcare, which has a different dynamic and a different um, 
a, a different, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Yeah, different dynamic. And um, so I know that we opened up our labs and the scientists are back working at a reduced schedule, but still working there. I keep working with my entrepreneurs. We're all online now and I'm just launching a global online class instead of trying to do a class on campus. It's changed the nature of the class that I'm teaching, um, but I'm still doing it and it's got pluses and minuses I can talk about later. But it, in terms of just what, you know, my, what I hear from people, I haven't heard what you're observing, which is just awesome. I mean, awesomely bad for San Francisco and awesomely good for Palo Alto. Well, it's, it, you know, what's interesting, it's more than just good or bad for San Francisco or Palo Alto. I think San Francisco was a mismanaged city before COVID hit, for sure. I mean, it had a homeless problem that was escalating and COVID just made it worse, right? Um, and it, unfortunately, it wasn't, you know, COVID exacerbated an existing problem that they weren't able to manage well in the city and made it much worse. So then that caused a lot of people to just get out. But what the interesting thing is, is that a lot, a lot of people perceive Silicon Valley as a hub of innovation. But as you actually, if you looked at like the whole of the Bay Area, it became so expensive and so uh, crazy because of the growth of Google, Facebook, Netflix, et cetera that um, smart people couldn't afford to live here anymore and start a business. So a lot of that had already been moving to LA, Seattle, other cheaper places on the East Bay. And really the pandemic has inverted that, that trend where now people are coming in to the Bay Area that couldn't afford to live here before. Uh, staying at vacated friends' houses, things like that, and, you know, starting businesses here that, you know, weren't getting started two years ago. I'm not saying that there was no innovation here, but it's definitely, COVID has definitely changed the dynamic that was heading downward for innovation in the Bay Area and inverted it, in my view. Definitely. I think part of what uh, Stephanie and Adair are talking about is just the way that COVID has ununiformly affected the U.S., especially in cities. You see um, the, frankly, higher income people were freaking out at the beginning of COVID, you know, what will happen to the jobs, what will happen to the industries, and it turned out that a lot of them could go to their summer homes and, and do their day jobs in, in a fairly similar way to how it was before, and then a lot of the lower income jobs have just totally changed often for the worse. Um, I think what will be interesting to see in terms of innovation is, will this really turn into more companies? And I think the answer is yes. Um, I think customers' preferences, consumer trends, um, people's ability to, to think about problems, that's all opening up in part by necessity and, and not necessarily in a way that we would have liked to spur innovation. But I, I agree with Adeo that I think that is going to happen. We're going to see all types of companies we wouldn't have even thought about before because people are being pushed out of their comfort zone in a way that that hasn't happened in the past 10, 20, even 50 years. Yeah, we're seeing a 5X increase in our numbers worldwide. Uh, three, three to 5X, but I would say it's more 5X, um, uh, less 3X, but if you were to be absolute. So every aspect of our business from number of people attending events to number of people enrolling in our launch programs for companies has gone up um, on the very, very low end three times and, and sort of on average around five times. So uh, that, that just to me is an indication that more people are going to start businesses now than ever before. And, and there's no, like, they're not necessarily been unemployed. They're just like fed up, right? They, they're tired of, sitting at home doing something they don't care about and they want to do something meaningful with their life. So they're saying, all right, I'm tired of, you know, crunching numbers at insert big tech company here that has no meaning. Uh, I want to do something meaningful, whether it's life sciences or, you know, helping uh, diversity and, and they're getting off their butt and doing something about it, which is great. So. And 
just shifting a little bit over to uh, David and his uh, community, his local community and, and the beat up he runs and also the different areas that you're involved in. Uh, with this kind of inversion back to or reversion back to how Silicon Valley was just, you know, years ago before the huge tech companies came in, uh, what additional uh, insights or issues or benefits have you seen from you know COVID happening and this uh, relation back to entrepreneurship? Okay, so um, I organize the largest entrepreneurial community since 2008, now it's like more than 13 years now. Uh, in the past, we run lots of offline events. The pandemic are changing the way how entrepreneurs networking and with other peers and finding their co-founders and finding their angels forever is a significant impact. I'll give you a couple uh, angles to take a look. So Second Valley is the world is called a headquarter or central or hub of the innovation because of um, the very active angel uh, and uh, entrepreneur and network. P particularly, there are lots of um, uh, startup communities. Uh, uh, FI is uh, one of them, and uh, SVE and there are many others. And uh, most of them are offline in the history. <clears throat> well, the reason for offline is that uh, in earlier stage, you want to look at the other person's eyes to get their feeling, get their confidence that this person can connect with the other peers, either as a co-founder or your angels, but the pandemic has changed uh, all those ways how people engage with each other forever. Like uh, I'll go to the first community. Now virtually there's no offline events anymore. Maybe there are a few very small organizations organize a very small number of hiking events still, but most of them stop. Everything's online and the most, almost all the incubator uh, stopped and uh, they have a very high vacancy uh, and uh, rocket space closed. And uh, uh, the accelerators, everybody's going online, 500 YC, everybody's going online. And right now you don't get the feeling of look at this person's presentation uh, anymore. And, uh, and now where does investors find their deal? Where does entrepreneurs find their deal? Uh, and unless you find a deal, how do you do due diligence? All those in process, the entire steps from one to the end, uh, get a funding and grow the company had to change because now you have to do everything online through Zoom, through people. So let me just bring a couple of the larger impact in general. I would say and the number one impact is that now uh, the earlier stage startups and the earlier stage investors are relying on relationship. We call it a prior relationship far more than ever because you cannot make a full judgment on the other people purely by Zoom meetings. You rely on the people who know them for years to make the judgment. And number two is that uh, I see the very positive impact is that uh, people are organizing startups more remotely. In the past, uh, we always encourage the founding team to get together every day, I mean, worst case every week, and now, okay, it doesn't matter anymore. People are organizing startups around the world to organize the team. And uh, the third impact we notice that is the uh, angel investment. So in the past, I'm sure everyone knows the 15 miles, uh, 15 miles story. Angels only invest into startups who lives within 50 miles from them. Now it doesn't matter anymore. You have to meet the founders online. So of course this brought, this is going to bring lots of challenges to due diligence process, but uh, angels are starting looking for the startups uh, uh, further like a couple hundred miles, or maybe thousand miles away from them, as far as uh, there's other people can help them to uh, do the due diligence process. So I would say in general, so this is going to be help uh, more global companies, more virtual companies to grow up, which is very different than a few years ago, what had been um, been um, believed. 
it, it's this really stark change, right? And I think all of you touched on it in, in, in different ways. It's the impact and how we've gone from hyper-local to global, right, basically overnight, even though we were already working in, in a global ecosystem, but the fact that all the barriers and all the geographical differences all disappeared with COVID really brings all of that home. And Adeo, uh, just really digging deep into how this affects your work specifically with Founder Institute. How does this move forward in the new normal really affect uh, the Founder Institute and the work that you do with entrepreneurs and what are you doing or what, what has changed and what are you doing to uh, navigate these challenges and help these entrepreneurs moving forward? Yeah, so we're in 225 cities and um, we've moved virtual and it's certainly, uh, you know, that's strange, right? Because you're like, oh, there's a London program, right? With people purportedly in London, but it's virtual, right? So what we we have a very nuanced view on what uh, going global and going virtual is because we are global and we are virtual and we have local operations in, you know, about 225 cities. So maybe I'll start by answering that, which follows on what David was saying. So, you know, at the end of the day, you as a founder, uh, choose consciously or unconsciously where you're going to be starting your business. And, and a lot of times that's where you're going to, where you're living right now. And, and what we have found is that everywhere there are entrepreneurs in the world, there are benefits and dis, and, and detractors, right? Silicon Valley, lots of benefits, but it also has lots of detractors, right? Very expensive labor's hard to come by, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Conversely, you know, if you start in the Caucasus or Central Asia, it's not very expensive and labor is a lot easier to come by. Uh, so again, every place has positives and negatives. So what I would say, the first thing that I, I, I've just, that the pandemic has unlocked is this ability to benefit more from your local positives and then, you know, get away from your local negatives. And what I mean by that is, let's say you're in the caucuses. Well, all of a sudden, you can still harness all the talent that you could get from the caucuses because you know how to post on job boards, you know what the, the requirements are to employ people in the caucuses. And now the detractors of the caucuses, which might be um, market access, investor access, et cetera, you can sort of throw those things away because you can use the global internet to reach the European markets much more easily, to reach European investors much more easily, the American markets, the American investors. Now back to what David was saying, it's so, so I think that's a very good thing, right? But it doesn't make it easy because people don't know what, the, what they're doing when it comes to making an investment without meeting someone. So we've been specifically, what we're working a lot on are establishing best practices for all these different types of things that an entrepreneur needs to do. So what are the best practices for an entrepreneur to raise money from angel investors in a virtual world? Now, that sounds real, like your suggestion, David, was great about, oh, maybe you can meet people who know you and introduce them to the investors so you can have trust brokering through third parties. What we found is, you know, it's going to take a longer number of meetings uh, focused on certain amounts of diligence in each meeting. And then an angel investor that might be, you know, a thousand miles away can get comfortable with the founder, comfortable with the business. It might require the angel doing interviews with trusted third parties. And we're building out processes to, to make those um, new paradigms a little more seamless for the founders so that they can, again, benefit from the local things and have processes and tools to benefit from the global opportunities as well. And then what that does is it takes away a lot of these um, detractors 
that used to, to plague founders in different geographies. Now, I want to add one other thing. Um, the thing that probably bothers me the most right now is that uh, people don't understand this. So I'm, I'm going to, and, and it's very important. There is more dynamic change occurring in the world today than I've ever seen happen in any amount of time, uh, you know, ever. Like whole industries, like oil went negative, okay? Travels upended, uh, you know, name the industry and there's like massive amounts of change. Like you might get lucky to have like one or two or three industries have massive amounts of change, but right now you're seeing pretty much every endeavor of humanity experiencing pretty fundamental changes. Healthcare, transportation, food, you name it, okay? Now, you still have people who are starting businesses that don't matter, okay? Unacceptable. You've got, you can start something right now. I'll give you an example. We're on Zoom webinar. There's a company called Hopin. It's brand new. There's another one, Remo. Those companies are going like, boom, they're brand new. They're getting more users than you could buy with all the money in the world nine months ago. Hopin or Remo nine months ago could be spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year and they wouldn't have gotten as many users as they're getting right now. So there's this once in a lifetime, and I promise you, you, you know, it, unfortunately, the, the plight of humanity isn't getting much better right now with fires and earthquakes and tornadoes and, and various other natural disasters on top of the pandemic. But we need to start working on things that matter and taking advantage of the changes that are happening in the world to make the world a better place, right? You want to change transportation? Great. It's changing. Come up with an idea that people love and believe in and you can make yourself uh, billions of dollars and make the world a better place now more than ever before. You want to revise healthcare and have better treatment and better care for patients? Great. You can do that now. You want to help with diversity. You want to help with any sector you're interested in. So much change is occurring that you plant the seed of the right idea and I'm telling you it's the right time. And you can, uh, we're watching companies just grow like crazy. I mean, we've had a 5X increase and we're kind of like a okay, interesting business, but like not that great. I'm seeing companies growing 5X day over day, right? I'm sure Remo is, I'm sure Hoppin is, I'm sure Zoom is still. So. If you, have a, if you have an idea on how to make the world better, now is the time. So, so I just want to address um, a tiny part of what you had to say, Adio, which is, um, you know, I work in the arena of life science and healthcare, and every day the things we work on are trying to make the world a better place. So that's never been an issue for us. We are always working on the right things. The issue is getting the funding. And there are not a lot of investors who understand the life science business and are willing to invest in very early stage. And I'm wondering. Well, well yeah, I, can I address that quickly? Because I got to go in one second. We're launching a thousand venture funds right now. Um, we're, we're, we're about to graduate a hundred funds and we're thousand over the next five years. So we'll do this year, maybe a hundred and something like 103. Uh, hopefully next year, 200 or 300. They're all early stage, and I can. And a bunch of them are focused exclusively on healthcare here in the states, here in Europe, here in Asia, all around the world. And so, yeah, it's a problem, but we're these are problems that can be fixed, and we are literally fixing exactly that problem. And I super don't mean to be rude or cut you off, Catherine. So sorry about that. I wanted to throw that out before uh, I head out. Everyone. Sorry, uh, I have to, speaking of healthcare, take my daughter to the doctor. <laughs> so thank you all. Bye, everyone.
Thank you, Dale. Really appreciate the time and also the really incredible insights. Really, really insightful. So thank you so much. Hope your doctor, your, your daughter's okay. Me too. Bye, guys. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> All right. So, so last so maybe I can finish the thought that idea <laughs> didn't let me, which is that'd be great if he's going to start, you know, a hundred or a thousand new funds that will invest in healthcare. You know, good for him, and I will be calling on him. Uh, but, the, you know, this has been a long term issue for this industry that I'm in. And I, I hope that something different happens, but I'm not sure that the pandemic alone is going to make all the difference. It's really important, right? Where his view is, it's this period of disruption where 100 percent true. And from your perspective and perspective of, of many, many, many people, it, not just in, in life sciences, but also uh, just across the board, and we'll, we'll get to this in just a few minutes, but getting the capital, the resources, and also the, the proper attention and care behind a startup to, to nurture it to the point where it can survive on its own and then proceed with the, uh, a traditional round uh, of funding or gaining those uh, really important customers to keep it afloat. It, it, it's so, the issue is so huge. I guess that's the word. It, 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 the, the issue is so uh, perverse and, and so huge that it, it, it'll take more than one person, more than one fund in order to address it. And I think this is a really good bridge back to David and the fact that you have you are actively working within the fund and you, you nurture uh, your community of, of entrepreneurs and, and venture capitalists and all these other folks who are actively involved in startups. Uh, you mentioned earlier about ways that the pandemic has helped entrepreneurs potentially reach uh, other uh, uh, venture capitalists and other folks and resources. How has COVID specifically affected the way that, uh, from your perspective, VCs in Silicon Valley engage with early stage startups and what have you and your team at F50 done to adapt to these changes? Sure. So there are just lots of lots of different changes uh, to how earlier stage investor uh, works, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so one of the fundamental impact is about timing. Uh, you know, uh, in the in March, April, I call it Q2 time. People, everybody's waiting. I'm not sure you heard about story that uh, uh, many of the Silicon VC actually send their team for vacation for traveling, uh, learning, training, because uh, they want to wait to see, uh, to do something after the pandemic is, is ending. So at that time, include, even include myself, we were hoping the pandemic should have ended like uh, June or even July, like summer. Unfortunately, we are in September, uh, the pandemic still going. So then uh, people start to adopt the new reality, they call it new normal. When it started, I call it June, June to July, most of investors realized that, uh, well, this is gonna last uh, for some time, maybe years, maybe, uh, maybe more than one year. So once people uh, decide this is the reality, we're gonna live that for a while, then people start to get back to work. So um, to start doing real think about investment. So two types of uh, investment people are looking for. Number one, we call the, uh, the sectors are being positively impacted by the pandemic. For instance, diagnostics and lots of areas uh, who are related, who are solving some problems or seeing the opportunities related to uh, the pandemic. So this area actually are receiving far more money than normal. And lots of investors are chasing the deals in this particular sector. The second areas we are looking for is uh, are the, are the companies or the areas who are not being impacted by the pandemic or will survive in a, health, in a healthy way after the pandemic is post pandemic. So these two areas are still, are still pretty normal in terms of investment activities. Unfortunately, in many other activities, which people typically look at the investment, 
have been seeing lots of slowing down of activity, slow down of funding, slow down of um, entrepreneurship activities. Not mentioning the fourth category is that because the negatively impacted by uh, the pandemic it means that because of pandemic, those activities become uh, unavailable or unnecessary or something. I give you a couple uh, areas. Uh, yes, uh, traditional transportation and uh, anything required a face-to-face -face, uh, engagement. Those areas are being impacted by a very large way. So what are the VCs are doing? VCs are, including many VCs themselves, are studying what is the life looks like next few years. The next question, just like Adele said earlier, what are the opportunities? So there definitely, I believe, uh, there are lots of disruptions are happening because of pandemic. I call them the opportunities, which is not being uh, investigated, or not being studied carefully enough, but uh, I do believe there are lots of uh, opportunities are being created uh, in the last uh, half a year. Now people have more bandwidth, particularly angels and investors has more time to look at this. Now they don't need to travel, they don't need to attend the meetings, they don't need to attend the events. They stay home and study deals or take a vacation. So this means that uh, uh, investors actually have more time than before. But again, the way they engage with the startups are fundamentally changed, uh, at least uh, going to be for the next uh, few years. I do believe the hours of uh, overall investment activity are decreased, um, but uh, uh, there are still lots of areas uh, are moving uh, in very active way in, the, in terms of uh, angel and uh, venture capital investment. Really appreciate everything you just said, David, and, and it's really trying to unpack everything. It's the trend is perhaps venture funding has decreased because of the friction now and people trying to figure out how to really conduct business. And then two, the way that they interact with founders and interact with each other, it, the whole process has shifted. So as people try to understand what's going on and how it affects them and how it affects their business, it, it's really this fundamental shift that may or may not even shift back after all of this is over. It, it could be just a complete uh, hard reset on how this whole process goes. So I think that's really important. And uh, going in line with both how founders are, are, are working together and also working uh, with venture capitalists over to uh, the academic side and the education side, uh, we wanna bring in Stephanie and with your extensive work both uh, in uh, the collegiate entrepreneur realm uh, with UCSF and also in the life sciences, wanted to ask, how have you and your team been able to translate the elements, the traditional elements of a, a collegiate incubator and bringing people together in person resources that really, what a college is traditionally known for? How have you your team been able to translate those elements and activate those support systems remotely? So um, I'll just talk a little bit about the class I used to teach that I decided as I was sitting at home in March was not gonna happen again. Um, it was a team-based experiential class. So people found each other. I did a number of mixers um, to try to introduce people to each other because people at UCSF who are would-be entrepreneurs don't know each other. They're in very different labs and different environments. Maybe they're clinical. So I would hold a series of mixers and I'd pop over to Berkeley as well, to the Haas uh, School of Business and look for students there who wanted to participate. So that clearly wasn't gonna happen in uh, COVID land. And so um, I cooked up this idea about having a global online lecture class and bringing in the Silicon Valley experts who I've used as guest lecturers in my Startup 101 class, but bringing them um, to a different kind of format and have them do a one hour lecture and uh, take questions and the audience would be global. And then in addition to that, I created 
the idea of peer forums so people could interact with each other. So even though somebody sitting in India and somebody sitting in Boston, uh, there was an opportunity for them to connect over some entrepreneurial interest. Um, and then I would have mentors come and facilitate those, um, those sessions. So that was the concept I came up with. And I was frankly amazed at how right on it was because when I put it out just as what we call customer discovery, meaning I'm just testing the market here. I don't have anything. I didn't have a course. I didn't have permission to do a course, um, but I put it out as if it were a course. And in 16 days, I had 167 signups. And I thought, wow, <laughs> I think I've hit a sweet spot. And so fast forward, we're starting the course in two weeks. Those signups were pre-registrations, which means people just expressed interest. Now we have registrations in the class and it's very solid. Um, so anyway, that's how things have changed. It's, it's a completely different format. And the beauty of it is we can do a global class. We can bring our Silicon Valley knowledge and this is focused on life science and healthcare, out to people around the world. Um, and we had 23 countries signing up in, in the pre-registration. People from Iran and Afghanistan and Brazil and uh, the Asian countries and Europe. And, and so it's really exciting to know that we can, we can carry the word out and help entrepreneurs every place. So it's the good and the bad. I was asked, I actually did a um, meet a mentor session this morning when my internet went out um, to, um, to just expose one of our mentors to the audience. And someone asked me the question about, well, in, in the pandemic is, do you think it's good or bad for entrepreneurs? And I said, you know, it's both. It's in some ways it's really good because you have a lot more access. and. By the way, the investors do have more time. Uh, they'll take meetings they might not have taken because they're not traveling and they're not trying to get to a lunch in uh, the Rosewood Hotel and uh, Sand Hill Road. And so there's an opportunity to connect with different kinds of people and, and more people. Um, but the bad is you lose the personal relationship building. And I know investors who will not invest in anyone they haven't either known before um, hand or they have a very strong recommendation from someone they know from beforehand. So it's a different, it's in a different investment scenario. Definitely the dynamics ha ha have shifted towards access being easier, but that strengthening uh, of that initial contact beyond just a superficial conversation is, is definitely much harder and definitely relates to you on both points. Uh, before this, we were doing, our organization was doing uh, hyper-local programming for student entrepreneurs and for folks in New York and Boston, and all that went away in March. And from there, we really built out a, a, a global network of folks, but I basically have never seen 98% of them. So <laughs> it, it, it's this weird dynamic for sure. And you know, 2020, aside from being the year uh, that all businesses change. I think it also is a year where uh, we have been able to underline and, and put a focus, heavy focus on um, inclusion and equality. And I, I think this is a good place to, to bring in Sydney and with her work. Sydney, uh, she is the co-founder of a Black VC and does some really incredible work helping to build a, a mentoring community platform for uh, Black venture capitalists. And Sydney, I want to ask you, what progress have you seen over the past few years in Silicon Valley to support Black VCs and what steps have your organization's taken to help them succeed, especially now through the pandemic where uh, you have a lot less of this face-to-face -face interaction and a lot more of people uh, being pulled this way and that online. Progress has uh, frankly been slow. Um, over the past several years, I will say that I've noticed that progress tends to be on the individual firm level. And, and it's been a lot less until a few months ago on the industry level. And it, it would be someone who was a general at a per, uh, general partner at a firm deciding, um, I care about 
not just I care about diversity, but I understand the the business value. I understand that there are deals or perspectives um, or or opinions that I'm missing if I don't represent diverse uh, investors and diverse entrepreneurs in my firm. And so you would see certain firms. Um, taking steps to make sure that they're, they're seeing all the deals out there from different pipelines and that they're um, having pipelines of diverse investors. Um, and then I think over the past couple of months, uh, since the Black Lives Matter movement has gotten sort of a revamp and, and people have been protesting widely and publicly over George Floyd and many others' death, um, I think you have seen some pressure on the industry and on the tech industry, um, understanding that this is the future of so much job and wealth creation, um, and it's still very, very monolithic. Um, I, and I also think one of the most important changes over the past couple months has been the empowerment of existing Black investors and existing Black entrepreneurs to speak their mind. Um, I think there's been a stronger Black community um, that's brought together sort of through this trauma. Uh, and so you have Black entrepreneurs at their own firms saying, oh, you know, now I can finally tell you what my experience has really been like as a Black entrepreneur, as a Black investor. And you have entrepreneurs saying, I'm really going to think about um, who I take onto my board because I understand that having the same kind of investor over and over again is really limiting the advice I'm gonna get on the growth of my company. So I think the change you've been seeing is more of a change in tone and a change in emphasis and a change in perspective. Frankly, I think the changes in terms of dollars and power and control are gonna take much longer to be seen. Um, and, and I think the one thing I'll caution against is sometimes you can have a change in tone that creates a perceived change uh, in reality. So maybe we see a couple firms promoting a black investor to a partner level, but they can't actually write their own checks. Or you see firms investing in an entrepreneur, but it's out of a separate fund because they're afraid it will affect their returns. So I think what I'll be looking out for over the next couple of months, the next couple of years is a real tangible decision-making change in terms of who gets to uh, controlled where the dollars are spent and what entrepreneurs are controlling, you know, the, those investments. So we'll see there. I, I think one really important thing that, that you mentioned that I want to further underline, it's great for people to have uh, good intentions about how to really get more people of color and more folks who are not inside the circle, quote, quote unquote, uh, involved but it's a whole other thing to really as you mentioned empower them to make decisions and to spend the dollars and until we get to that point we still have a lot of work to, a lot of work mm -hmm. to do and a long road to go so you know kudos to, to you and your team for, for taking on that initiative and, and for really uh, making at least some inroads on, on trying to uh, bring everyone together and lift in uh, tide so I think that's a really great way uh, just for people to understand that for as much as Silicon Valley is a leader, there's always room for improvement. And I think this also goes to, in our general discussion, everything is being upended. That's a constant. That's something that we know for sure. But it's about how do we really shift and work together in order to uh, really help everyone get to that next level. And I, David, want to start with you here. What can incubators, accelerators, other VC firms, universities, what can all the stakeholders do over the next 12 to 18 months to ensure that Silicon Valley remains this global hub for innovation? What can we do? What can the community, what can the stakeholders do to make sure that that remains a fact and that not, not everybody just goes away. David? Okay, so well, community is the fundamental part of the Silicon Valley. Uh, then the next part is the VCs. I believe the investors will be there. So we just need to really continue to support uh, our early stage funders 
everybody know only small percentage of funders get funded and among them only small percentage funders are successfully uh, with uh, later stage venture capital money and have exit but uh, the people actually who started the company in the very earlier stage uh, I call the bed of the innovation uh, as far as we continue to support uh, and those earlier stage uh, entrepreneurs in many different uh, uh, sectors and in many different uh, areas. Uh, so we believe the Silicon Valley is kind of here to stay. Uh, also, the Facebook, or Google not allow people to work remotely. Uh, I'm not super concerned as Adele said that actually that bring lots of more innovation ideas in the Valley. So uh, also, I do see the opportunity that uh, many and startups are being going global, going virtual. This means more innovation from other cities are going to uh, surface up. But still, uh, Silicon Valley is going to be uh, the headquarter uh, for the foreseeable uh, future. And uh, actually, what we are doing is that we are going global. You know, SVE entrepreneur community, we organize hiking events, we organize uh, uh, demo events in the past always face to face for the last 12 years and this year for the first time ever our event is online and globally we actually presented a couple of startups uh, from India and uh, from uh, Japan from Europe to present uh, at our community events so what I see is that this is a great opportunity to connect Silicon Valley with uh, other communities around the world uh, which actually will uh, help the startups at the same time so will make Silicon Valley even stronger. Thank you. I agree with everything David's saying. I think the success of Silicon Valley is in many ways dependent on being a global economy and a global um, sorry, innovation, innovation system. Because the truth is, um, like so many have said, Silicon Valley is small. It is um, you know, not as diverse as the rest of the world. It's very expensive to live in. It only represents a small section of, of views. So the way that many Silicon Valley companies have been built, frankly, is built on immigrant talent, immigrant founders, um, built on, on uh, technological innovations that wouldn't necessarily be affordable if they were developed in Silicon Valley. So I think one of the things that's most important to the future of this industry and to the future of Silicon Valley as we see it today is to continue to invest in companies, entrepreneurs, and investors outside of the Bay Area that are, are pushing forward the innovations that will make this industry even stronger. So I, um, I never think Silicon Valley is going away. I, all the naysayers from time to time I uh, think, you know, we're all moving out of here and uh, it's gone too far and so on. I, I just feel like there is such a tremendous nexus of uh, people, resources, information, and so on, that it's, um, it's not going to go away. So we've just all learning uh, to make this a virtual community. And it doesn't really matter whether uh, David sitting in China, or I'm sitting in Maine, or I don't know where you'd want to be, Sydney, Boston, maybe. Um, but, you know, it doesn't matter. We still all identify with Silicon Valley. Our networks are in Silicon Valley, and I, we're just going to be doing more of the same. It's just changed its format. We're not out every night, um, you know, seeing bumping into people that we haven't seen for a while and making that unusual connection that we never would have thought about. It's, um, it's, Zooms and set up meetings and, and it's more structured. And so I miss that flexibility of our old lives and I hope we'll get it back sometime soon. Um, but in the meantime, this isn't a bad surrogate and you know, we're all learning how to make it work. Definitely, it's one a learning curve, which uh, most of us, have gotten past and it's a matter of and we've been able to adapt and it's just a matter of how do we mesh the past and the present together to, to come up with it with a, a, a good future that makes sense for everybody where everyone can benefit and the universal thing i'm hearing from the three of you is that silicon valley is not just a place and it's not just a physical realm it's the people in the community and how that reach really extends past the place 
and, and can really affect change in, in elsewhere. Uh, David, you brought up uh, about different places and, and Sydney, you also brought up about uh, different people. Stephanie, you really put it together uh, about uh, just the, the community in general morphing into uh, no matter where it is, but it's all connected with Silicon Valley. So I think that's a really important thing that we can take out of this. During the course of our discussion, we had two uh, snap polls, uh, one about how people view Silicon Valley and what they see as the unifying factor. And really interesting, everyone basically agrees with the three of you about uh, it's an excellent place for, for mentorship and resources. And the poll we have now about what the number one thing Silicon Valley needs to do in order to attract and retain more talent and founders, uh, I think this is a, a fairly obvious one, especially from uh, pre-COVID days, but more affordable housing and the cost of living. And uh, it could be that because of the exodus of, of people leaving uh, the Valley uh, just to, uh, spread their wings or to relocate to somewhere cheaper, that this may be a, a sub effect and this may happen. This may uh, cause some uh, positive changes moving forward. So I, I think that's something uh, we should all look out for. Uh, doesn't look like we have many questions from the audience. So uh, we'll just wrap up. Uh, we'll start with uh, each of you. We'll start with Stephanie. But uh, one thought in terms of what you hope to see moving forward with just the Silicon Valley community and where you hope to see it move forward to in the next year or so as we move past COVID, what would it be? You know, I, I hope we can maintain our cohesion. It's one of the real strengths our community has and um, start thinking more broadly, start thinking in new ways as COVID has disrupted so much of the way things are currently done that's healthy, um, you know, outside the tech world, rethinking education, it seems clear that needs to happen. Um, so really taking advantage, if you will, of a very difficult situation and looking at the positive that this is going to uh, force people to take a new approach to what's been ingrained in the past. And Silicon Valley is always a leader in uh, generating new ideas and innovating, and I expect we're going to continue that. I I hope to, of course, see more um, diverse individuals controlling the dollars in Silicon Valley, but I think the number one thing that I really hope changes is some of the emphasis on um, the friends and family round in venture. I think it's something that's really holding the industry back is the the need to have raised dollars before you can raise more dollars. And so how do we get those entrepreneurs who are incredibly talented, but need maybe that, that 10 K or, or that, um, you know, extra support to get to the point where they're ready to, to quit their great job at Google or their great job at Uber or whatever it is. Um, I think that's going to be the next challenge that will really create a lot more businesses um, and a lot more sustainable businesses as well. Well, so my suggestion to the entrepreneurs is that uh, look for the opportunities. Also, there are lots of challenges, but you take a challenge as the opportunity you will find a potential good man. And uh, now you can connect your co-founders, partners uh, uh, globally and also find the Android investors globally. So I think that's an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you all of you so much uh, for your perspectives. Stephanie, David, Sydney, we really, really appreciate it and really thankful to have uh, all of you here and Adeo uh, earlier uh, to bring all of you together and, and to really showcase what Silicon Valley is about and is all about community and, and trying to lift each other up uh, through knowledge and also resources. Uh, really quick before uh, we let everybody go here, um, for those of you who are looking to learn more about venture capital or to speak with venture capitalists, we have a wonderful event next week uh, with Megan from Seed Invest and also Victoria from Expert Dojo. Uh, so that's next Tuesday's event. Uh, following that, for those of you interested in a career in technology, we have recruiters from Lyft and Medium 
who we're going to be speaking to next Thursday. And also our next City of Tech event is the Future of London Tech on October 20th. So if any of that interests you, feel free to reach out to us. It's linerun.co backslash events. We hope to see you there. Again, uh, David, Sydney, Stephanie, really appreciate the time and your knowledge. And for those of you who tuned in, whether it's live or you're watching, thank you so much for uh, joining us and joining our discussion. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time.